Hello and welcome to today's episode of The Insider, brought to you just for a change by Vanishing Inc. My guest today's, wait for this, confident deceptions make his magic a real game changer is Jason Ladani. Jason, welcome back to the podcast. How are you this morning? I'm doing all right. I am doing good. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for doing it. Um, what's your magic origin story? You've got 22 seconds. <laughs> 22 seconds. Well, I'm going to burn mm-hmm. up the first five seconds of it, laughing at the question. <laughs> uh, my older brother showed me a card trick and um, he put the four jacks into four different levels of the apartment building and left one on top and knocked the roof when the police were coming and showed me the four jacks on top. And my mind was blown. I think it was seven. And that didn't, you know, you're learning how the world works and all of a sudden that, sure. that doesn't add up. And plus, my brother was so much cooler than me. He was 18. And in his room, he had a pool table and like model cars and like cash laying around, you know, like <laughs> it was probably like $18 at the time. But I remember thinking like, oh, that's like money. Baller. So, yeah, yeah. This, uh, nunchucks and, and throwing stars. I mean, it was like the coolest place in the world. And uh, of, it, we're playing cards in there as well, guitars and things. But when he showed me that card trick, that trumped all of that other cool stuff. And uh, I, that was it. I wanted to, to do card tricks after that. And here I am. Did did he show you how it worked, or did you have to find? Well, that last jack was a little bit thick, um, so it didn't <laughs> it didn't survive a second viewing. But I did understand uh, the deception behind it, and was I love that when I could do it to fool other people. That was the best feeling in the world, and I had to fool my parents with it. And uh, that stuff took ten years, but it finally worked. <laughs> and here you are. As we're emerging from the, the pandemic and people are starting to get back to some degree of normalcy, what are you most enjoying? Um, <clears throat> well, this past uh, year has been really something else. Um, you know, my life is usually inside shuffling cards with any practicing and writing and, and things like that. Uh, and I get out once a day to, to run. So when the pandemic happened, it really wasn't that much of a change, to be honest. Sure. <laughs> it's just like people are flipping out. Uh, because they're stuck inside all day. And I remember thinking like, well, you get used to this, you know? Uh, But the thing that that I really missed was uh, obviously the gigs, uh, the online thing works to, to get, to do a show and stuff, but there's nothing It doesn't, it will never compare to having somebody hold something in their hands and having a a live audience, 30, 40 people circled around you. What the energy, Uh, you don't get that in a Zoom call. You never will. I missed the shows. I missed the reactions. And honestly, after uh every so often um after these long writing sessions or or practice sessions or whatever i enjoy going out and having a good dinner you know and and uh that that i really missed because you were basically (laughs) eating the same it was just like you'd open up the fridge and be like i guess i'll have this again you know i know it's a silly (laughs) point to make but going out no 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 it's not it's those little things that impacted everybody uh, scotch or a, a nice bottle of wine that you've never had before at a nice Italian restaurant, that kind of stuff. I really missed that. So when the pandemic started to wind down, uh, we <clears throat> went out uh, and got some food. But like a month later, all the, the uh, COVID restrictions started to show up again. So <laughs> mm-hmm. here we are again. Here we are. Um, when you did our blog series about favorite card tricks, you mentioned loving new deck order routines and you've got several tricks that end like that what is it that appeals to you do you think about that plot it's the strongest thing it's it's i don't mean to sound like a control freak but (laughs) you have ultimate control over every single card in a deck an ambitious card routine you're controlling one card four aces you're controlling the aces uh uh, reds and blacks you're controlling half the deck you know but uh there's there's something about it's like the ultimate. It's the penultimate effect, as far as I'm concerned. That you put penultimate. Yeah, that you put all fifty-two cards back in the original order. And when I do these routines earlier in the set, of course, the spectator is shuffling the cards. As a matter of fact, it's always right before the effect um, that they they do this. And obviously, with you know methods, of course, they, the lay person believes that the deck that they just shuffled is the one that ends up in order at the end. Mm. But um, they it is just it's just too much for them to comprehend and when you stack it up against anything else out there any other closer it just it just doesn't uh, compare uh, out of this world comes pretty close um but but um that's them doing it 
if you think I, I, I think about a lot of this stuff. Who's who's in charge here? You know, it's, it's my show right. and, and all that other stuff. So my character is all about me. James Bond obviously kills the villain at the end. I mean, I imagine how disappointing it'd be if the villain fell down a set of stairs at the end and Bond was like, Well, this is cool. I don't have to go out there, you know? I don't like that, right? We want we want Bond to, to kill the guy. So I so that making me the hero of my own show, I want to be the one to, to put those cards in order. And I've been performing this stuff for 15 years now, and I can tell you from experience over and over and over again, when I have that particular finish, when you start spreading those suits out, people just cannot comprehend what you've just done. Uh, there's a funny show about the Magic Castle. I did that uh, Liar Liar, which is where they end up in order. And I finished the show and I left the four suits on the table. I said, thank you, good night. If you know the castle, you go behind the little red curtain, but you're right mm -hmm. there. You're you're two feet from your table, but they think you've gone backstage or whatever. Sure. And all the people got up, like a funeral procession. 30 people got up and walked, and one by one, like walking past the casket, <laughs> walked past the table, and people were going, are they real? Are these real cards? And people were touching them, and the, you know, the husband touches, and the wife's like, don't, don't touch it. And, and the people, the next group of people are like, yes, they're really in order. How could he have done that? How could? And that just tells me that they're, they're just fast. They'll remember that for the rest of their lives. And that just doesn't stack up against tearing a card and putting it back together or having a card appear in your pocket. <clears throat> Interesting. Um, you're also interested in prop bet style routines. Why do you think they resonate so much with audiences? One word, interactive. Ah. Uh, if you, I've learned a long time ago that if you perform magic at your audience, it's up to them to, if they want to tune out and play on their phones or whatever, they can. But if I tell you right now, I want you to think of a number between one and a hundred and I'll give you 10,000 bucks if I can guess it. What are you going to say? Um, you know, I'm, I'm just going to play on my phone. I don't need the 10 grand. I'm sure your trick's great. No. Not only do you, as the spectator, are now fully invested because you stand to win money. The rest of the audience wants to know, why is he so, he can't do this. And why is he so confident? How does this play out? So it's instant connection with your audience. And you've established prior to this, that you are a card cheat and a winner. So they're going to be on the lookout for your cheating, right? So now they know, okay, he can't do what he's claiming to do. So I'm going to watch him and catch him because there's money on the line. now. So you've, you've said a few, you haven't even done anything and you've said 25 seconds of patter and the whole audience is on their edge of the seats watching now. You know, you don't even have the money on the table yet, right? So that, that's, that's the secret to, to prop bets there. Um, and they're in, insanely fun to do. And then, of course, in mine, I always tip the odds in their favor because I say, you know, I am a professional cheater, so let me give you these odds. So now when I keep improving the odds for you, not only was it engaging to begin with, but now it's even easier to win. So like in the uh, war routine, I just got a notification there for a second. Um, in the war routine that I do, it's not a prop bet, but it's playing against the spectator. Eventually, I'm letting them deal the cards or make the just like, okay, you what do you want to do? Do you want to play high card wins or low card wins? And since I'm giving you all of the um, uh, advantages, you're, you're, you're hooked, period. How do you take the sting out of them losing? Uh, well, that's an uh, uh, involved uh, answer for sure. But <clears throat> the secret to it is that you're keeping, uh, you keep changing the odds and tilting them in their favor. So by saying, no, 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 you do this, you do this, you have control over this, you have to, uh, control over this, because I'm so powerful uh, that I'll give you these advantages. So you shuffle again, you deal the cards, you deal my cards, whatever. And that way they can see that it's not you doing it, you're giving them all of the control, and that the cards insist, the cards insist that I win. And I'm off the hook now, because you had all the control and you still lost. That's not, I'm, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so that is half the answer. Uh-huh. Uh, and the other half of the answer is that the people like me, they have the, the, they know that this is a joke. They enjoy laughing. And, um, if, if they don't like me and I'm not giving them any advantages, it's like kicking a puppy on stage right. or beating a kid, playing as a kid. And if, imagine them having a six year old kid on stage and going, Oh, you lost again, you idiot. <laughs> How stupid. How stupid. I mean, the audience, uh, you'd be devoured. So when it's a grown adult and they know that this is all a joke, they know when I say, when I say what a shame. They know that's a joke and that I've d somehow done this. But they had all the control and they still lost. So they're wondering, how the hell is he, how is he doing this? So they're seeing the magic part of it. They're laughing at it and they're laughing at me pretend to be like, like 
I've never seen this before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is humorous and they will enjoy it. And also, uh, one last point I wanted to make on these, how come you win all the time? Questions from some magicians I hear. What kind of card cheat would I be? <laughs> if, <laughs> I mean, come on, folks. I shouldn't have to address this issue. <laughs> but I'm claiming to be a world-class card cheat that's done this in games and done this in casinos. And I know everything about this, but I can't seem to win a damn hand. It, it doesn't comp- it, you know, it doesn't compute. You have to be good at doing this. Uh, and then other people, other magicians talk about the, the, I'm talking about the cafe or genie forum type uh, responses mm-hmm. to this stuff, or even beginner magicians that aren't sure how to do this. Oh, it's all, he's making the show all about him and all that other stuff. Go see a, when you go see Pink Floyd and Dave Gilmore's on stage taking solos, you're not like, oh, Dave Gilmore's going to take another guitar solo. Look at him. <laughs> Look at him. The whole show's about him showing what he's good at. <laughs> or, a, or, a, or a classical piano player who's up there playing and you're going, oh, all he did was play piano all night. Really well. Yeah. <laughs> the nerve. And he didn't invite me on stage to make me feel special. I hate him. I'm going to go on the Magic Cafe and talk about how much I hate him. <laughs> you know, so, so um, it's, it's okay to, to win on stage. It's okay to play games against your spectator uh, that they lose, as long as you understand the rules that I had mentioned. They have to enjoy you, like you know that you're in a character, uh, and um, uh, you tilt the odds in their favor. And it, it's people are there to have fun. And if they if if that's their mindset, it's it's a win. And I've been doing it for twenty years. I think I should know, right? I've never done yeah, a, yeah, yeah. a show where people go, you know, you really should have let that person win. <laughs> you know what I mean, I've never heard that in my life. <clears throat> Talking of talking of character, twenty years ago, were you the same? Did did did, did the dial on the oh yeah it, it arrogance yeah, yeah, it be, be the same? It changed by a, a, a lot. I used to just be good at what I do, and that's it. You know what I mean? Here's I'm going to take the aces, put them in the deck, push them in, and now they're on top. Not bad, right? You know that very 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 dry uh, character because I didn't know what my character was. You know, I was figuring mm. it out at the time. And then, I don't know, maybe five, six years into, not less than that, maybe three three years into performing, uh, I started noticing some ad-libs and comebacks. You know, the audience would say something, I'd have some quick, wit, uh, witty comeback or something like that. And the audience really liked, they laughed. And I remember thinking, oh, that, that was fun. And then the, the confidence and the, started to creep in. And then those kind of arrogant things creeped in. And the more I did that kind of stuff, I found that that was like this interesting little hook. Like the trick was happening, but there's this extra dialogue kind of happening mm. during this, the scripted part. And then those ad libs started to creep into the permanent script, you know. And the more I did it, the more people liked it. And then I turned it up to 10, and people still loved it. So I turned it up to about 50. <laughs> and, still, and it doesn't, I mean, if you watch my castle set, uh it, that's that's cooking on all cylinders there i mean the show is just me 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 you know people ask me what's it like to be right all the time i don't i don't know you know i don't know it just is you know and, and people because it's a drama audiences want drama think of bond yeah, yeah. you know it's everything is as much it's not just a car chase for up a street where he bumps into a shopping cart no, the car is probably driving through a supermarket, with, you know, with people jumping out of the way and it blasts out the other side and the whole building collapses. People want mm. drama. So I noticed that when I crank that up, and I'm always coming up with new lines and, and all this other stuff, I'm so smooth I make butter jealous, you know? Um, <laughs> you know? And and people uh, just, they think, could you imagine if somebody was really this full of themselves, you know? And I'm really enjoying it. I think I may, I, I don't know how much further it's going to go, but I keep cranking up. Yeah, that was, that was the next question. Do you think there's still room? <sighs> there's a, well, you never stop done learning. Um, and there's always new tricks to come along and you have to find out how to. No, work. I meant room to go up. Yeah, that, but that's what, I'm answering, that's what I'm answering though. I'm saying <laughs> there's new tricks and you can find new ways to ramp things. I'm sure there's lines out there that I'm, I'm going to find. And there, I learned, I read in some book somewhere about comedians that you have to, put your foot over the edge sometimes to see where the, the limit is. And yeah. I, I honestly can only think of a handful of times where I have dipped my foot right over the edge. But uh, it's so far, it's, it's fun finding 
what the audience appreciates and what they like. Yeah. You've also talked about wanting your audience to be emotionally invested in what you do. So my question is, how do you take a card trick and add that to it? Vernon always spoke about an emotional hook. And do you have, is there a process to add or to find an emotional hook for a card trick? The card, the cards are just there. That That's not, you don't have to worry about the props you're doing and what you're holding. It's the scenario and the story that you're telling around it. So it could be coins or any type of magic. Uh, it's a universal experience is usually one good thing that you can say. Have mm-hmm. you ever noticed how X, Y, Z? And if the whole audience is going, yeah, you know, exactly. I, I do notice that. That's now you've connected your audience and you've brought them in to listen to whatever it is you're about to say. But the, the cards are just there to help do things. If you say, I want to generate a certain emotion and I'm a painter, well, then you use your tools, your paint and your canvas to create mm-hmm. said emotion. But if you're a poet, you don't have paint, you have words now but you want to create the same emotion. So I just happen to have cards that do things that help me create these types of connections with the audience so that the prop makes no difference whatsoever. Um, And like I said, you just start an engaging story. Have you ever wondered, or people often ask me this or that. Uh, My triumph routine, for example, is about uh, my brother. He's always giving me a tough time. You know, he was always ripping the cards out of my hand or trying to screw my tricks up. And one time him and his friends came in and ruined everything. You know, that's a classic underdog story. Like your older brother and his four friends or three friends were bullying you. And they, they can and everybody can identify with that. And then yeah. you talk about the struggle. And then you finally have that triumphant uh, victory at the end. It doesn't matter that the cards were there. But it makes it look better as I tell the story that's funny. And the cards are acting out the things in the story. That's the, that's the template. That's the secret right there. A lot of magicians, I think, overlook gambling routines because they might think audiences find them hard to follow. Um, you have a big love of them, obviously, but somehow you manage to make sure that what you're doing is easy to follow. How do you take something complicated and make it simple to follow? That's a great question. And um, you have to understand that not everybody plays poker so it's kind of like when you're teaching uh, back in the day teaching in the you know 1850s or whatever you had people that were just learning and people that were 20 years old still learning you know it's it's a mixed classroom of all sorts of different ages and different skill levels so you basically have to to get everything on the same level you have to get all your information on the same level so no matter what you know or don't know can be absorbed so that's why you should not be talking about dealing specific straights to this guy and I'm going to deal a ace high flush to this guy which is going to beat this guy's queen high flush and of course you realize he has a 12% chance of hitting it on the on the river after I burn a card like people are like what they're not going to know what any of that means it's like aces are good you got kings I got aces and they're higher and they look pretty when I fan them out and that (laughs) not making this up your blackjacks can't be uh, an eight and a three and a 10. Your blackjacks are a suited ace jack of spades, preferably. Your royal flushes are in order. You know, your, it's, it shouldn't be four nines that beat your four threes. What is that? that that's ugly, nines and threes, you know. It should be aces uh, that beat your kings. So um, basically it just means, and there's an intuitiveness to those hands, by the way, like the four of a kind or things like that. And the other, part of it is that you can read your audience. So earlier in my show, so my show is usually about 40 minutes or so, I can put my feelers out there and, and ask, are there any card players? Uh, and if I get crickets back, I'm going to do a magic show. Right. And also there's there's gambling themed tricks. Do you ever notice in blackjack? Of course, a blackjack is an ace and a jack. See how I just taught it? We're just going to be dealing with these two particular cards. And now I've talked about blackjack and I've talked about cheating at blackjack, but the trick is really between just an ace and a jack so they're easier to remember. That's gambling themed, not a gambling trick, you know. So the audience doesn't have to know about blackjack to appreciate that. But now they can associate the two cards uh, with blackjack and they're easy to remember. You know, that's a, that's yeah, a way yeah. to do it. But in the uh, what I was saying earlier about reading your audience, if I say, does anyone here play cards? This happened at a show just a couple weeks ago or about a week ago. Whole place lit up. Oh my God, we play all the time. And so I did a hardcore gambling set right to the end. And they loved every second of it. 
and they would appreciate that much more than basic, you know, kind of magic tricky uh, things mm -hmm. like oil and water or whatever. They appreciated uh, Best for Last, which is dealing out every single poker hand. Oh, and by the way, in Best for Last does have, that's a trick where I deal out every rank of hand. I have that same problem. How do I get average people to follow this? Well, a deck of cards comes with a rank of hands card, and that's built right into the trick. As I open up the deck, I say, oh, here's a, a rank of hands card. This has every single one. I'll show you an exercise I do with this here. Frank, can you hold this for a second? What's the first one say? One pair? Oh, you know. So, I mean, I've found ways to teach what I need to teach in a simple way right before executing it. So that way I'm not leaving my audience out there going, what, what is he talking about? I've literally taught yeah, it yeah. Uh, right before I execute it. Do you think that those, when you, when you toss out the fishing line and say, is anybody into cards, can you gauge quite quickly how serious they are? And does that change the angle that you're going at? Because it could be somebody that plays bridge once a week or somebody that knows all about poker. Uh, well, there, do, you, there, do you have testing kind of tricks? It's not that you just might... one. Uh, it's not just one question and that's it. It is re right. reading how they responded to the first tricks and things. Uh, who here plays poker? Does anyone here play cards for money? And you know, and you can sense what's up. And then I'll do a trick. And then I, I, based off the reactions, if I'm feeling something's not quite working, I will venture off into that. But like I said, with those gambling themed routines, I can still stay within my gambling atmosphere, but staying uh -huh. away from specifics of games. Has anyone here heard of yeah, whist? Yeah. You know, who, no, no one. I mean, the whist is dead. So I'm not going to do that. But I can reference um, a. a, a simple rule out of one game and then use that as the like yeah. high card cut for example sure. i mean or war high card versus well low i was card. just gonna say you war, know the, yeah. that's that's the secret is boiling it down to the essence of something that's so easy that people can just follow along because the last thing i want is anyone getting lost in what's going on mm, and that's not course. good yeah you want pure clarity the whole time your book confident deceptions which was a smash hit and sold out it's just about to come back into print um what are some of your standout i know it's probably like picking a favorite child but what are some of your standout pieces in the book all of them <laughs> next question <laughs> i'm not even joking i i do, i i picked from when i put that book together i had about 25 routines or so and i said let's pick the i forget what book i read this in but if you're at the stage where you've got multiple things and you're trying to put something together, you pick the best of the best, you know, and then you pick the best of that, you know, so that way your books guarantee or whatever it is you're doing has, the, it's just will be the best of the best. So I weeded it down to like 20 and then I weeded it down to 18. So there's no filler. I, my heart is in every one of those tricks. I do them all. There's no filler. That's the whole point of the book. And, and part of the reason why I wrote the book is because I hated when I was a kid and read these books, I'm looking at my, books i know that doesn't make sense on camera but all my books are here um i i read these books and thinking i i just spent you know a week going through this book and everything sucked yes this is one cool trick here but all of this is terrible material place 12 cards in the spectator's hand claiming it's three <laughs> have you ever done this trick because no you can't place 12 cards in their hand and claim it's three that doesn't in the real world that like what are you no so I would read things, or the setup would be read this amazing trick, like spectator names a card and then they pull it out of their own pocket. I'm thinking, oh, I'm, I'm hooked. I'll read that. And then you read the method and it's like, you need 20 sevens of spades for this and 12 of them are going to be torn in half vertically. You know, and you're thinking to yourself like, oh, come on. So I wanted practical, strong material that you could do anywhere with any deck, regular cards, and, and just and just kill audiences. And, and I my goal was to do all these tricks for years and i did that i was, was working restaurants and gigs and things like that and each trick got multiple performances to polish them up and when they reached that level i said they're ready for the book and you can right. just tell sometimes when you read a book that this is not something somebody does this is just a cool idea to fool magicians or something mm -hmm. and they put it in a book to see their name in print but the my whole philosophy in this stuff is i should be at a show or out and someone says, oh, you do magic. Can you show me something? And you should open up a deck and do the material in these books. There's there's a section in the book following every trick with the crediting for it. Why do you think crediting is so important? 
well, obviously you have to give the, the legacy of that person needs to live on. I don't want to be the guy that's just stealing, other, you're getting credit for someone else's uh, brilliant thinking. Um, I do enjoy taking credit for springboarding off people's ideas. So sometimes Vernon will have a great idea that went in this direction, but I took the, the original thought and mm -hmm. just used it for a different purpose. I, I like that stuff, but I still have to give Vernon credit for whatever the whatever that setup was. Um, so that it, that's just kind of a no-brainer. You can't you can't just leave that stuff out there. Now, personally, I didn't do a lot of the credits in the books. Um, I have a team that does that stuff uh, for me that helps. Uh, and they just know much more than I do. I'm constantly being creative and premises and character development, things like that. And I'll miss some credit sometimes. So my buddies like Tony Cabral and Dennis Bear and uh, Darwin, of course, uh, the guys at Vanishing, you, you, uh, Josh and Andy know a lot of great uh, credits off the top of their head, by the way, which yeah, is nice. So I can reach out to those basically. guys and say, hey, I've got some ideas here. And then, of course, there'll be people that disagree with certain things but that's just the name that's just going to happen it's baked in yeah you don't know yeah. people come up with independent things i have an idea that i came up with maybe four or five years ago uh, independently i was there thinking about it and i said oh my god i just broke the code did the trick for a couple of years showed it to my buddy tony cabral and he's like oh yeah that's in mint that's in mint one and i'm like <laughs> it's oh. everything's in marlo everything <laughs> It is. And I looked it up and it's like exactly what I had come up with. And um, this, that's it. so I can say in my book, it's how I, I have my ego has to be fed here. So I say I independently came up with this, but However. <laughs> it was also thought of by Marla. That way I can still get credit for the thing. But sure. you have to be able to, as younger magicians especially, have to realize that when you come up with something and you find out it's someone else's, either do it the way I just did it or just you can't. You can't do it. There's been tricks uh, that I've come up with that just are too close to somebody else's, like Pitts, for example. I'll, and then you just, it's his. I just came yeah. up with a slight variation and it's not worth publishing it. Now, last point on that is if you do come up with the variation, like I said, you take someone else's idea and springboard off it. Um, are you moving the effect and the method far enough to even bother putting your name on it? Mm. Adding an Elmsley count or, you know, you know these things. We've talked about this in other, I've heard you mention this, you specifically. You can't just add a little thing to it and say, okay, now it's mine. You, you really have to move the bar. And just yeah. by tweaking the handling a little bit, you don't get to stamp your name on that and, and call it your own. And under, I think it's fair to say that an underlying theme in the book is your thinking on how to maximize the impact of each effect, something that your mentor Darwin Ortiz was a strong believer in. Do you think that every single trick has a part you can alter to make the impact stronger? If so, how do you do it? Uh, Cristofero said it best, the one degree formula. He's spot on with that. Uh, and the secret to that is that you have to be intimately familiar with your routines uh, and be able to think through these things. So many magicians just kind of do. like. Like they just do it or they read the book and they do the things in that row. But you have to separate yourself from the trick, the mechanics of the trick. Think about what the audience is seeing. And yeah. when you think about that and stop thinking about the method and the handling and the technique and all that, you can start to see, okay, this trick boils, the essence of this trick boils down to the cards at the end are separated red from blacks. That's the, that's the thing that they see. They go, wow. And then you look back in the trick and you say, okay, what proves that? Oh, it's this moment here when, when they shuffle or I shuffle or whatever happens. So you need to bring all attention into that one thing that is directly related to the climax at the end. And that way the audience is fully absorbing. And if you watch a movie sometimes, you'll notice that you miss certain parts. You're kind of like halfway through the movie and you're like, why are they here? Why did they just kill that guy? I thought he was on that team. Well, you missed something in the movie, obviously. So when you watch it a second time, you go, oh, that's right. I didn't on this conversation. I missed this little part. And that may be the director's fault. They didn't put enough attention on it. Sometimes in crappy movies like Fast and Furious, or something, they're delivering plot lines during a car chase. You know, you're busy watching the car chase and you're missing out on important information. That's a mistake, you know. So when you do your magic, you have to find out what is the one thing that I really need to stress in this, that they need to fully comprehend and buy. What's the thing they need to buy? Mm. Uh, and once they, uh, a, a, a good thing that I have happened in my tricks sometimes is when I pass that moment, if I can get them to accept this reality, it's like I just locked the door and I just threw away the key. Because if they're buying this, at the end, it's going to be the opposite. And that's, you have to find that one moment. 
And if you can do that, it's good. There's a collector's plot where I say, okay, the four aces are face up in the deck, they're under your hand. That's it. And if they buy that, the ending's going to kill them because the cards are already in there. And they haven't even selected you, right? So in the other deck, you're having the card selected, but they know under the hand. So the relationship there is if they buy that display, yeah, yeah. then the ending is going to be so much stronger. But if they, if you were telling jokes and you said, okay, I'm going to put the aces in this deck and, hey, anybody here from Georgia? You know, and then at the end of the trick, you're like, okay, now the cards are in your hand. They, they never really fully bought the the beginning of the trick. So they're going to kind of be like, wait, what? That's what they're going to say. Wait, how did... Now it's kind of confusion instead of instead of uh, astonishment. Yeah, yeah. Is there one single piece of advice that Darwin gave you that you think is the, the most important thing he, yeah. he shared with you? It's a simple answer. It's... Uh, be always get out of your comfort zone you know but that's it if you stay too comfortable you always do the same safe effects or whatever like that you're not going to grow so always make sure that when you're every chance to perform is something where you're stepping outside your comfort zone a little bit is that doing a new thing turning the dial up on the arrogance of... something some i'm going to try Anything. this tonight yeah i'm going to i'm going to bring this old thing back in i'm going to try this new trick i'm going to do so, something because if you if you're constantly just doing the same things and staying within your comfort zone you're not growing at all so it doesn't necessarily need to be a new trick it could be a line and or it, a it could, timing exactly. or beat it could be a story that you want to tell a short you want to t do a monologue in the middle of your thing to try it out you know the yeah, audience yeah. It's, it's okay to bond with your audience with just you you know what i mean ricky j you know ricky j talked a lot <laughs> you know what I mean? mm -hmm. Put the cards down and told the story. People loved it. Yeah. So um, imagine trying to say, so do a few tricks as an opener and then walk in front of your card table and do a short monologue. And then that leads you into the second part of your act or something like that. That can be terrifying to think I have to put my props down and go out and talk to you. It's not a new trick, For it's sure. just something new. Maybe I'm not going to roll my sleeves up tonight. I've had a lot of criticisms about rolling my sleeves up, and it does damage the suits over time. But fortunately, I'm made of money, bro. I just keep buying it. <laughs> so, oh, this is wrinkly. Throw it out and get me another one. Um, suit monkey. Yeah. Run. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rico. <laughs> suit. <laughs> so the, the question everybody wants to know the answer to is that Eddie Carter, any number that you posted on the socials, and I think we shared on our social. Are you ever going to release it? I am trying to, to find out what to do with that because I honestly, what we were talking about in the beginning is social media content um, just for the sake of putting it up and you have to kind of stay with it. Uh, before the interview started, we were talking about this and, and uh, you have to constantly post. And honestly, I just kind of put it up there. I thought it was great. I'd been fooling around with a new concept. And so I just threw it up there for social media content. And sure enough, you know, overnight it got like 7,000 views or something. I'm like, what have I done? And uh, so I figured if it fooled the internet, it should be able to fool Penn and Teller's Fools. I sent it into him uh, since I posted it. Actually, before I even posted it as well. I think when I made the video, I sent it in. Um, I, I've heard back from them, but they did not. Uh, they, they asked, can you send us some material? So I sent them some more stuff and I haven't heard from them when the pandemic happened. So what I would ultimately like to have happen is to do something like that on the show to get maximum exposure on it and then release it. Because if I just release it now, it's just going to be another download. Yeah, yeah. And then I'll see somebody else doing it on Penn and Teller's Fool. <laughs> uh, so I will most likely do that as a, since it's getting so much attention, do it in a standalone release, I think, um, as a download or something like that. Um, the next book is already done and the routines are picked out there's a different acon in, in this next book but the one that you're talking about with the suit and the mm -hmm. value and the position uh perhaps uh, the fourth book and it's okay to to have this stuff like it's just just enjoy being fooled yeah no i uh, i and do there's no rule that says that if you create material you have to put it out absolutely you know, you don't have not to release it and i i i like it i'm enjoying being in the position that I'm in where a lot of people think it's fake, a lot of people, you know, it's, well, who gets to have the last laugh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's just, uh, what I'm doing is combining a lot of very old, um, a, very, a lot of old concepts kind of all put together in one thing, and it allows for some pretty serious stuff. And it, basically, if you watch any of my social media and you're fooled, I'm pretty much using the same handful of things each time to do that. It's, I, think, these I think it's one thing when 
you see comments from lay people on YouTube or wherever saying, oh, it's a stooge, oh, it's this, oh, it's that. He's cheating, cheating. But when you've got an audience of magicians saying that you're cheating, you know you've really fooled them. <laughs> yeah, and I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm totally fine with having that power uh, for now. I will release it, I, I, 100%. I'm on video, I'll say it, I promise. I will, I will release that someday. Um, you're going to hate me. Uh, but I think I, I've shown it to a handful of people. I've shown it to Darwin and to uh, Tony Cabral has seen it. Um, and I love Darwin. He always says, you are, you are despicable. <laughs> <laughs> and I say, you, you made me who I am yes, today. It's your fault. You yeah, you created me. Uh, the method is just diabolical. Talking of unreleased material, you ready for the segue? Talking of unreleased material, it's your masterclass live in October. Are you going to be sharing anything new there? I am. I purposely want to make sure that I do unreleased. I want people to come in and see new stuff instead of just seeing kind of the greatest hits of some of the older stuff that I've already put out. This is for people that are familiar with my work. So there will be a handful of things that um, that have been released, but in print that mm -hmm. haven't been videoed yet. Um, so some people, I love that when I'm at a convention, I'll do something and people go, whoa, what was that? I said, it's, in my, it's the first trick in my first book. And they're they're going, oh, I have your first book. <laughs> so you got to read it. Um, but I'll be doing a handful of things that are from the books, but have never been videoed before. So they will be new to a lot of people, not even on the DVD set or downloads or anywhere. Um, and then another, a few of the greatest hits that you may have seen before. A few things from the second book I've got uh, lined up and ready to go. And then I think three things that have just never been seen before. How exciting. Two or three things. And who's the masterclass aimed at? Because if people ask you what you're known for, I think a lot would say that it's advanced card handling and gambling routines. Is that what you're going to be covering? Well, I know that people are watching this to learn something. So I'm not, my goal isn't in there to go say, look at all the stuff you can't do. Um, my book, a good analogy for my book is like a cookbook. There's a, there's something in there for everybody. Where, okay. wherever your skill level is. And they're not necessarily like easy in the beginning and tough at the end. It's just as you go through the book, there'll be a trick that if you can basically self-working, if you can deal cards, you can do this trick. There's another trick that, okay, you've got to do a multiple shift for this. But that's it. There's another trick where you have to, 90% of it is basic card handling, but there's a bottom deal at the end. So, but there's only 20 cards or something. So, you know what I mean? It's a, it's designed in such a way that it's not a, a brutal bottom deal. It's like you can add misdirection and do the bottom deal if you want. And in my books, I even mention that. If you read my books and you're familiar with them, if there's a complicated bit in there, I can recognize from my own teaching, this is going to be hard for somebody. I'll offer a, a second method to say this is a little bit easier. It's not the best method, but it'll get you to do the trick. For example, a sight count. One of my tricks has a 12-card pinky count. Right, most magicians are. There's like you know ten people that can do a pinky count. So I know this. So I say, if you can't do a pinky count, do a sight count. And now all you've got to do is take a deck and and as you spread over, I'm spreading over three, 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 three. I just did twelve cards right there. Yeah. And that's anybody can do that. So I will offer the easier methods. But in this particular uh, masterclass coming up, it's a little bit for everybody. Super, super basics. If you've never handled cards before. You should be able to uh, get your hands on it. Some moderate stuff. If you've handled cards for a couple of years, you should be well within reach. And then even the harder stuff, I picked some of the easier of the harder stuff. Uh, I would say Pharaohs. Will, that's, when, when I say this is a little bit tricky, there's a handful of routines that will have a perfect Pharaoh in it. And are you going to touch on your technique for doing a pharaoh or you're assuming absolutely yeah right. that's the same thing with the books if there's a complicated move in there uh you don't just glaze over but also i will say that comp, uh, card college is always a reference that i use if you're into card magic there's no reason why you shouldn't have card college and that right. those books and when i'm writing my books it'll say i'm using such and such move you can find it on page 278 of of, car, of card college as a yeah, matter of yeah. fact i think that's even this, the right page the top poem <laughs> not that i'm like you know, perfect or whatever. So anyway, I, I, I will show, I will do that in the books and point you right to where it goes, or I will actually just explain the move. Uh, for example, the multiple shift, I teach that right in the book with pictures and everything. And of course, during the lecture, I will teach that uh, stuff. If it's a, I'm not going to teach a double lift, but if it's, 
something that's a little more complicated, I will show it. And lastly, I wanted to mention that if you do watch the lecture and you feel like I've missed, skimmed over something, there's the question and answer in the third week. Come in and say, hey, listen, show me some tips on your Faro, or what am I missing? Can you help me? And I'll, I'll spend time in that part of the lecture explaining it. What are you most looking forward to about it? The masterclass? Mm -hmm. Just an opportunity to share my material. I love, uh, look at this made me a career. I mean, I have like five Lamborghinis. Uh, <laughs> you got, you got I, the I, suit joking. guy? I, I have one. Yeah, I only have one. Um, no, I, I've made a career out of this and I enjoy the energy on stage uh, in performing this stuff and how it receives my audience and the social media following and the comments and the people that enjoy this stuff. I'm talking about TikTok and, and things like that where it's really good engagement. Um, and that feels great to do this stuff and get that kind of uh, response to it. Yeah. And I am giving you the keys to it saying, this is, this is it. This is what I've done. In part, this is some of the stuff that I do that, that has put me here where I am in my life. We are just about out of time, Jason, but we always end the show with four quick fire questions. Are you ready? Yeah, I can't guarantee the quickness of it, but go ahead. It's early for you, so it's fine. Uh, favorite pizza? Wait, it's, it is pretty, well, hang on, it is pretty early here. What time is it there? It's four o'clock in the afternoon here. Oh, if it's four in the afternoon, why don't you say something, man? I'll just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why didn't you say something? All right, anyway. Um, favorite pizza be topping? Day? Ooh, pepperoni. Favorite movie? Oh, you always give the hard ones. Oh, I do know it. Um, Carlito's Way. Favorite person or people that make music? Man, that's so hard. Mm. Albert King. And finally, who would you rather fight? One massive Andy or a hundred tiny Joshuas? A hundred tiny Joshuas because I get to just murder over and over and over and over and over. I mean, Andy, you got to fight it. And it's only one thing when it dies. But with Josh, it's just it's just the repeat, just squashing. And I would enjoy that. <laughs> Jason Nadani, thank you so much for giving up your time this morning. Everybody listening to this, hop along to vanishingmagic.com slash masterclass, where you can sign up for Jason's masterclass, which is starting in October. Or if you prefer... You can subscribe to Vanishing Inc. Plus, which for the same amount of money will give you Jason's Masterclass, plus access to our new streaming service, plus free shipping with no minimums. And the banging is the dog <laughs> wagging its tail. <laughs> just as I was doing my perfect outro, yeah, you can say, say, just bye, so good. say bye bye. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you. I'll see you later. Cool, man. <laughs>